Welcome back to the Indie Vets Happy Hour. I am your host, Dr. Andrew Heller, DVM, and I'm here as usual with my co-host, Dr. Marissa Brunetti, VMD. Yeah. And uh, we want to welcome you to episode number 32. Wow. Um, A lot of great episodes that we've completed in the past. And today, we're actually doing something really fun where we're going to sort of summarize them all in form of a quiz. Yeah, we're we're all so used to, you know, quizzes and tests as veterinarians, so. I love quizzes. Bring them on. I do, too. I actually, what this reminded me of, Andrew, was clinician's brief, right? I'll just, even if I don't have time, like, I'll get their quiz in my email and I'll take it. It's five questions and I'm just testing myself. So this should be fun. And we're going to take questions from all of our previous episodes and we will tell you which episode they're from. So in case you're like, oh, wait, I didn't know that. Or I want to learn more about this. You can go back and re-listen to some of our episodes And then moving forward, what we're going to do is have more in-depth quizzes on each of our pods that you can go back and listen to um, to test your knowledge. Awesome. Well, how many questions do we have here? We've got we've got 18 episodes, 18 questions spanning all of our episodes. Some of them weren't clinical episodes. um, and You'll know which ones those are when you get to them. But we kind of skipped around a little bit. But let's start with episode number four. So this is question one. Episode number four, this was actually one of our most popular episodes, and it was the um, extra label drug use episode. We had a bunch of our area medical directors from Indie Vets there to um, go through some of their favorites. And so the first question is this, which of the following drugs is used extra label to treat lymphocytic plasmacytic pododermatitis in cats, or some people call that pillow foot? Is it A, Serenia, B, doxycycline, C, cisplatin, or D, adequan? I'm going to say the answer is B, doxycycline. Ding, 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 ding. Yes, we we should all know that cisplatin splats cats, so never use that in cats. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but doxycycline, certainly treatment of choice there. Extra label, of course. All right, so you want to do number two? I do. So also from episode four, our favorite Serenia, lots of off-label uses. Which of the following is not one of them? A, chronic rhinitis. B, as an antitussive. C, as an anti-inflammatory. And D, as a pre-medication for anesthesia, for visceral pain. Or E, none of the above. Serenia works for everything. You got to say E on this one. (laughs) (laughs) When in doubt, use Serenia. <laughs> Serenia is a jack of all trades. Yes, use it. absolutely. All right, number three. Yeah, question three. This is from episode five. According to a 2019 study by the International Society for Companion Animal Infectious Diseases, uncomplicated sporadic bacterial cystitis, or simple UTI, should be treated with antibiotics for how long? Is it A, three to five days, or generally until symptoms have resolved, B, seven to 10 days, C, 14 days, and no less to prevent antibiotic resistance, or D, pulse therapy for one to two days at a time. Oh, my goodness, Andrew. This one is tough, but since it's very specific to the 2019 study, I will say A, three to five days, generally until symptoms have resolved. Yeah, and actually I I love that question because I think it showed me that I was treating it too long. So that one was certainly a good one. So you're right. Three to five days generally until symptoms have resolved. All right. Question four is from episode 10. Which of the following methods are not acceptable ways to induce emesis in a dog? (laughs) And this is a checkbox one. There could be multiple answers. Okay. Don't use which of the following. A, liquid soap. B, Hydrogen peroxide, C, apomorphine, D, ropinerol, or clever, or E, mustard powder. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, hydrogen peroxide, we all know that's the common usage. Apomorphine, definitely use that. I know that's that's a good one. Clever, or the ropinerol, that's, that's actually what the whole episode was about, um, inducing emesis. So it's not that. I'm going to go with liquid soap and mustard powder. (laughs) And definitely not together. 
Correct. Definitely not by themselves or together. Excellent. All right, my turn. Episode 11. This was, I think, the beginning of our summer series. Hot Pet Summer, Volume 2 coming up. This goes to show you, we're, we've, been, we've been doing this for now over a year. Um, so we did this last summer. So when discussing heat stroke, which abnormality has been shown in approximately 60% of heat stroke cases and usually indicates significant thermal injury at the level of the bone marrow? Is it azotemia? B, prolonged clotting times. C, nucleated red blood cells. Or D, Heinz body anemia. So uh, I'm going to guess if we're talking about the bone marrow, that this is going to be C, nucleated red blood cells. Good answer. You are correct. All right. (laughs) Question six from episode 12. Which of the following treatments would be the least effective when dealing with noise phobias in dogs? Is it A, Zilkeen, B, Trazodone, C, Adaptal, D, Buprenorphine, or E, Saleo? Well, I'm going to go with D, Buprenorphine, because I don't believe opioids have any uh, efficacy with noise phobias. Correct. You are correct. Yes. This is actually a really good episode to go back and listen to. You know, storm season is upon us. So this would be a good one to re-listen to. Awesome. All right. Well, number seven, episode 13. What major organ system does Lily ingestion affect primarily in cats? So this was, I think we did toxic plants here. So Lily ingestion affects which major organ system in cats? Is it A, the digestive system? B, the renal system, C, hepatic, or D, the central nervous system? (sighs) My cats are the reason I can never have anything nice on Easter, but I'm going to go with B, renal. You are correct. Thank you. That was a good episode, episode 13, Toxic Plants. Definitely go back and listen to that one. That was a good one. And so was episode 14, which is our next question, question eight, for ectoparasites. Which of the following diseases are not associated with fleas? My nemesis. Is it A, tapeworms, B, typhus, C, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, D, Bartonella, or E, bubonic plague? Gosh, okay, so tapeworms, definitely. Typhus, hmm, not sure. Uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, pretty sure that's ticks. Bartonella, fleas, bubonic plague, fleas. I'm going to go with C, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. You are correct. I read this book about the Black Death, a.k.a. the bubonic plague, because I'm obsessed with it. But I remember them talking about how there was lots of stray cats around because no one kept cats in their house back then. And everyone thought that the cats were causing the plague. So they killed off a bunch of cats. But really, the cats were killing the rats that had the fleas, and so it made it worse. So, note to self, some people worship cats, and some people think they're the devil. (laughs) Yeah. All right, so number nine, episode 15 on atopy. What is the mechanism of action for Apoquel? So most of you general practitioners out there should know this, but for anybody who's not a GP, you can test yourself here. So is it A, a Janus kinase inhibitor, B, a monoclonal antibody, C, an antihistamine, or D, a neuromodulator? Ugh, gross. Um, <laughs> so what's the answer, Dr. Brunetti? It's a, it's a jack inhibitor, Janus kinase. I, I actually, once I heard that, I never forgot it. No, never. All right, question 10 from episode 17, vaccines. True or false, Andrew? All killed feline vaccines contain adjuvant, which has been implicated in the increased risk of tumor formation versus recombinant vaccines. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say true. That That is a uh, an aspect of, of uh, killed vaccines. They have to put adjuvant in there. Yep, absolutely. All right, another one on vaccines. So number 11 from episode 18, um, where we talked about canine vaccines, which of the following is classified as neither core 
nor non-core by AHA or Wasava vaccine standards. And the hint here is this vaccine has been described as a vaccine looking for a disease. So is it the Lyme vaccine, A, B, lepto or leptospirosis, C, bordetella, or D, coronavirus? This is really easy, Andrew. It's D, coronavirus, despite, despite COVID-19. We do not vaccinate dogs for coronavirus. Well, that's definitely a good one to listen to, episode 18, because we talked a lot about the coronavirus vaccine and how it's fallen out of favor. Um, although we still see it at, at some practices here and there. So we do. It's a vaccine looking for a disease. <laughs> I, I agree yep. with that one. All right, your turn. All right. Question 12 is from episode 20. Feline injection site sarcomas. Which one of the following are recommendations from AAFP regarding vaccinations in cats? Is it A, don't vaccinate in the interscapular space? B, do decrease your vaccine volume in cats? C, do give injections in a distal limb or tail? Or D, do obtain incisional biopsies versus excisional biopsies from a suspected vaccine-induced sarcoma? This is a good question. So don't vaccinate in the interscapular space. That's true. So it's not that one. Do decrease your vaccine volume for cats? Uh-uh. So it's definitely B. You, you do not decrease the vaccine volume for cats. Just use what the manufacturer put in the vial. Um, exactly. But C, do you give injections of distal limb or tail? True. And what, this was something that I learned. Yeah, you definitely, when when suspecting, um, you know, a fibrosarcoma in a cat, you're not supposed to take an excisional biopsy. You're actually supposed to do an incisional biopsy because you could mess up. You could actually... Um, Miss your margins. Yeah, make, make the yeah. margins more difficult in the future. Yeah. I hate this disease. I think I said that multiple times during the pod. <laughs> anyway... So number 13, episode 21, this was the vaccine grab bag. So it was kind of like everything that we didn't shove into <laughs> feline and canine vaccines. And this is sort of uh, this is sort of a, a funny one. But which of the following vaccine mistakes does Marissa guess get most annoyed by? <laughs> oh, God, all of the above, probably. I'm sure, it's going to be all of the above. But there <laughs> is there is one that was that she really was annoyed by. So is it a administering the, the DHPP every two years? What the? <laughs> You're like, yes, it's that one. Um, B, is it giving a Lepto or Lyme booster 15 months after the first series? So basically not giving it soon enough. Uh, is it C, injecting all vaccines in one location on an animal's body? D, not recording where you gave a vaccine? Or E, separating vaccines by one week? Oh my God, or less than two weeks. And that's my... That's my biggest pet peeve. So that would be E. But I hate all those things. So all of the above is a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> Separating vaccines by one week and all the other things too. Okay. Yes. Okay. So question 14 from episode 23. I think everything has Addison's disease. So what percentage of the adrenal cortex must be non-functional before clinical signs are observed? A, less than 20%. B, 50%, C, 70%, or D, 90% or more? This is a tough one. And, you know, I had to look this one up, but I'm going to go with D, Alex, 90% <laughs> or more. That's D, Alex, what is 90% or more? What is 90% or more? <laughs> Absolutely right. 90% or more of the adrenal cortex had to be non-functional before clinical signs were observed. I mean, I think it's really important to mention that since our animals can't talk, I mean, it's similar to kidney disease, right? Like once 75% of the kidney is gone is when we're starting to see increases. So note to self, recommend blood work early and often. Awesome. All right. I'm going to give you the next question. Number 15, episode 26 on Cushing's. So which statement about Cushing's is false? Is it A, most common signs of the disease are PUPD? That's uh, polyuria, polydipsia, muscle loss, and skin or hair abnormalities. B, poodles and dachshunds are overrepresented for this disease. C, a normal urine cortisol creatinine ratio does not rule out Cushing's. Or D, when running a low dose dex suppression test, 
the dexamethasone must be given IV or it will fail. So which of those following is false? Yeah, this is a long one, and I'm definitely a visual learner, not an auditory one. So everyone else listening who is a visual learner, Cushing's is commonly seen as PUPD muscle loss and skin hair abnormalities. It is overrepresented in poodles and dachshunds. You must give dexamethasone IV. So I'm gonna have to say C is false, meaning a normal urine cortisol creatinine ratio does rule out Cushing's. Excellent, excellent. All right, question 16, episode 28. What's new in 22? Zoetis manufactures Serenia, Convenia, and now Silencia. What does Silencia do? A, it's a new revolutionary treatment for FIP, or B, a new revolutionary treatment for feline arthritis, or C, for stomatitis, or D, type two diabetes? It's B, feline arthritis. Absolutely, looking forward to that. Well, we had Anita, Kelly, and Amy, right? Who who yep. was the one who talked about it? Kelly. Yeah, Kelly did a great job covering what, what Silencia does. So definitely go back and listen to episode 28. All right, this one's for you, Marissa. Episode 29, not too long ago, we, we covered canine pancreatitis. So which of the following drugs has been associated with an increased risk in pancreatitis in dogs? Is it A, azathioprine, B, sulfonamides, C, tetracycline, D, potassium bromide, or E, all of them? E, all of the above. (laughs) That was an easy one. (laughs) That was an easy one. All right. And last but not least, in our last pod, episode 31, feline pancreatitis, which of the following is least likely associated in a cat with pancreatitis? Is it A, high fat diet, B, triaditis, C, trauma, or D, my favorite, pancreatic fluke infection. Yeah, so this was, I remember when we were talking about this and like pancreatic fluke infection, we kind of laughed off, but we're like, hey, you know, it just depends on where in the country you are. So um, that's certainly been seen with with um, feline pancreatitis. Trauma, I think dogs and cats, both their pancreas can get affected that way. Triaditis, very common in cats with pancreatitis. So I'm gonna go with high fat diet, which is sort of yeah. cool. not what yeah. you think. So A, high fat diet. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think we got 100% on that. that yeah, quiz. we're so smart. We're so smart. I hope we get extra credit. You know what? It's because we've listened to our podcasts again and again, right? <laughs> All those thousands, ah, yeah. those thousands well, of listens, half of them are us, right? Well, we did we did write it. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, this, was, this was actually really fun to put together because it actually, these were things that I thought were interesting from our from our talks. Hope you guys out there found it interesting too. Absolutely. Go back and enjoy. I think um, the next series we should do is the breed specific series. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah, and that'll be short. So we'll be taking um, common breeds of dogs and cats and discussing potential congenital diseases or other common diseases in in these breeds, things to look out for, and especially talk to puppy owners of these breeds just to, like, you know, make sure that we're telling them all the right things they need to know. So, yeah. Stay tuned for a cool title of that, of that series. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, guys. We hope you enjoyed this episode on the Indie Vets Happy Hour. Thank you for listening. Tell your friends. And if you like us, leave us a five-star review and make sure to subscribe so you can be alerted whenever we have a new episode. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, you can email us at clinical at IndieVets.com. Also, to learn more about us and how we're making vet med better, head to IndieVets.com. That's I-N-D-E-V-E-T-S dot com. While you're there, be sure to head to our blog for the latest stories and tips from our doctors. And lastly, if you're interested in joining our amazing IndieVets team, please email Dr. Andrew Heller at Andrew at IndieVets.com. See you next time. Cheers. Cheers. I'm a veterinarian, sure, but I'm way more than that. I am also a tango dancer, a struggling but determined pie maker, and a mom. With IndieVets, I get to choose when and where I work. I create my own schedule and choose shifts at nearby animal hospitals that are right for me. Having that flexibility is exactly what I need to have plenty of time for all those other things that I am. 
because I'm more than just a vet. Visit IndieVets.com to learn more and apply.